Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the session of machine learning. Uh, today we will have six excellent presentations covering the topics of uh, applying the machine learning technologies for helping the VR applications. So uh, we will have six presentations and each presentation will not have any individual uh, Q&A uh, time. So we will have a joint Q&A after all the presentations finished. Uh, for the audience, please uh, just place your questions in the Discord channel and our volunteer will collect all the questions in the Discord channel for each paper and uh, we will, uh, I will read them out to all the different presenters uh, to, to, to uh, conduct our question and answer session. Okay, so let's welcome our first speaker. Uh, Qi Jing Shen from Fuzhou University. Uh, his topic is continuous transformation superposition for visual comfort enhancement of kairoscopic photography. Uh, let's welcome Qi Jing. Please share your screen, Qi Jing. Okay, okay thank you. Um, hello everyone, I'm Shen Qixin from Fuzhou University of China. I will represent our work on visual comfort enhancement of casual stereoscopic photography. The goal of casual stereoscopic photography is to allow common users to create a stereoscopic photo using two images kept by a handheld molecular camera. As shown in the figure on the left, common user first take one image, move the camera horizontally, and take a second image. However, the random motion of a handheld molecular camera will reside in a stereoscopic photo that does not satisfy geometry constraints and is now with a comfortable disparity range. To improve the visual comfort of a stereoscopic image, several learning-based methods have been proposed in recent years. New AL currently manipulate the left and right views until they reach the optimal conditions. Kim AL adjusts the disparity by simulating camera motion to obtain comfortable stereoscopic images. Different from the current learning-based methods that use some fixed and discrete transformations as actions, we apply continuous transformation as actions to approach better solutions. Besides, we use self and the close attention modules to enhance and integrate binocular features of a stereoscopic image. Following new AL, we assume that by superimposing some basic transformations including rotation, translation, and the perspective. Images from casual stereoscopic photography can be transformed into comfortable stereoscopic images. To achieve the continuous transformation superposition, we prepare a collection of multi-type and the mass scale continuous transformation models. These models can predict continuous transformations of left and right views to make stereoscopic images more comfortable. Then we train an agent to determine an optimal transformation chain to recurrently handle both the geometric constraints and the disparity adjustment, and thereby enhance the visual comfort of stereoscopic images. Besides, considering the binocular information of a stereoscopic image is the key to visual comfort, we proposed an attention-based stereo fusion module to enhance and integrate binocular information. The structure of the attention-based stereo fusion module is shown in the figure on the left. Firstly, we utilize self-attention modules to enhance the features of left and right views, respectively. Then we use close attention modules to fuse the, the enhanced features, and the structures of self and the close attention modules are shown on the right. Now, let me introduce our framework detail. At each step, the features of left and right views are enhanced and fused by an attention-based stereo fusion module. Then our agent samples an action based on these features. Each action corresponds to a specific transformation model in the model set. Finally, the selected transformation model is applied to the previous image. This process will be iteratively performed for four times, and the final image is produced. During training our agent, 
we use the sum of the structural similarity index and the VC metric to measure the reward of a specific action. Then we apply the target network strategy and the mean square error loss to train our agent. For experiments, we randomly transform images from high quality stereo image data set to produce low quality synthetic stereoscopic images. We then evaluate our method based on these synthetic images. In table two, we compare our method with image rectification methods. In table three, we compare our method with combinations of image rectification and the disparity regression. For all the experiments, our, our method outperforms others. Besides, we collect a set of real world images to evaluate our method. As shown in the figure, the sign object in our results usually meet geometry constraints and within a comfortable disparity range. We also conduct a user study to validate our method through subject evaluation. As shown in the table, for each participant, we calculate the times of selecting our results rather than loss of comparison methods in the 35 comparison groups. To better distinguish the effectiveness of each factor, we conduct ablation studies on the number of reinforced length net steps, the effectiveness of continuous transformations, the attention-based modules, and the reward design. We show some visual examples of the attention-based module, which pays more attention to the regions with large disparity values. However, our framework still have several limitations. Firstly, only those transformation types and the scales that exist in our model set can be well handled. As shown in the figure, our method can nowhere enhance the visual comfort of the input image because the disparity of the input image exceeds the range that our model set can process. Secondly, through depth, depth perception is implied in high quality stereoscopic images. It's necessary to consider depth perception in a reward design. Finally, we summarize our work as follows. In this paper, we propose a method for casual stereoscopy photography based on continuous transformation superposition and an attention-based stereo fusion, fusion module to enhance and integrate binocular information between the left and the right views. That's all. For more details, please refer to our paper. Thank you for your watching. Okay. Thank you so much, Chi Jin. Thank you for being okay. so in time. Uh, let's welcome the next speaker, uh, Bing Yao Huang from Southwest University. Uh, his presentation will be about SPAA, the stealthy projector-based adversarial attacks on deep image classifiers. Uh, please go ahead, Bing Yao. Uh, thank you, Prof. Zhang. Um, hi everyone, my name is Bing Yao Huang from um, Southwest University, China. Uh, we propose a spatial augmented reality technique to fool deep image classifiers with a projector. With the rapid advancement of deep learning, visual recognition regains main, uh, many popularity and high accuracy. How to protect the user privacy and security from unauthorized visual recognition becomes increasingly important. For image classification, we input an image X to a deep image classifier F. The output has the highest confidence in the label panda. Adversarial attack aims to add slight perturbation delta to the original image X. Then the perturbed image X prime can cause the image classifier to misclassify the input image as a given. This is digital adversarial attack, which requires direct access to the classifier's input image X. However, usually we don't have direct access to the digital images. Instead, we, on, we can only modify the physical environment of the scene by injecting adversarial objects or changing the light condition. For example, we can place a printed adversarial patch in real scenes such that the camera capture scene is classified as a toaster instead of a banana, or to evade unauthorized face recognition systems by wearing an adversarial eyeglass frame. Similarly, users can wear a special shirt to evade object detectors. We can also alter camera capture scenes by applying a translucent adversarial sticker to the camera lens. Compared with physical ones, light-based adversarial attacks modify only the environment light condition instead of the physical entities. Thus, they can be more flexible and transient by changing the projected patterns. For example, Nichols and Jasper achieved untargeted attacks with a low resolution projector camera system where only one projector pixel is projected to the car. 
Shen and the co-authors control camera shutter speed to capture human imperceptible adversarial patterns. Wayne and the co-authors project the strong adversarial patterns to full face recognition systems, while Joe and the co-authors use infrared LEDs instead for better stealthiness. Unlike digital attacks, subtle physical and light perturbations are hard to capture using digital cameras and can be easily polluted by complex environment. Thus, to improve robustness against these factors, most existing physical and light-based adversarial examples are designed with strong artificial patterns, while stealthy attack remains an open problem. In this paper, for the first time, we formulated the stealthy projector-based adversarial attack as an end-to-end -end differentiable process and proposed a method named SPA, which has higher attack, sec attack success rates and meanwhile being stealthier. As shown in the figure, our scene consists of a projector, a camera, and a soccer ball. Denote the camera captured the scene image as IX. If we input it to a deep image classifier F, the output shows that the label soccer ball has the highest confidence, which is correct. Projector-based adversarial attack aims to project a stealthy pattern X prime to the scene such that the camera captured scene IX prime is misclassified as a table lamp. Note that the adversarial projection is exaggerated for better visualizations. To solve for the unknown adversarial projection pattern X prime, we can iteratively optimize it by minimizing the loss between the classifier output label and the target label. But the real project and capture process is non-differentiable, thus we cannot simply use gradient-based optimization methods. One solution is to include the real project and capture process in a gradient-free optimization pipeline, for example, differential evolution. Due to the high computational complexity, this approach is limited to low image resolutions and only perturbs one project per pixel. Even so, it still suffers from low attack success rates and the project the magenta square on the soccer ball is clearly not stealthy. Another solution is to first perform digital adversarial attacks on the original scene, then use a projector compensation technique to solve for the corresponding projector input image. However, this two-step method is problematic because digital attacks may generate physically implausible adversarial examples. Our spot approximates the real projector capture process with the neural network PCNet. Thus, the whole system becomes end-to-end -end differentiable and both gradient-based optimizations and physical constraints can be applied to the projector-based attacks. Similar to CompNet++, we first project and capture a series of colorful texture sample images to the scene, then we train PCNet to simulate the real project and capture process. PCNet uses CNN-based modules to transform a projector input image X to an inferred camera captured scene image IX hat. We train PCNet by minimizing the similarity between the model inferred camera capture projection IX hat and the ground truth real camera capture projection IX. Once PCNet is trained, we replace the real project and capture process with it and use gradient descent to perform projector based adversarial attacks. Inspired by per se AL, we optimize adversarial projection by alternating between the minimization of the, uh, of the adversarial loss and the stealthiness loss. Finally, we project and capture the optimized adversarial projection X prime to the scene for testing. In quantitative comparisons, our spot clearly outperforms the baselines by higher attack, ses, attack success rates and the stealthiness measured by LP norm. We show comparisons on targeted projector-based adversarial attacks. The goal is to use adversarial projections to cause the classifier to misclassify the bucket as mushroom. The three rows present the results of our SPA and the two baselines, respectively. The first column shows the camera capture scene. The second column shows projector input atoms. The fourth column represents the scene under projector-based adversarial attacks. Namely, the second column projected onto the first column. As shown in the fourth column, both baselines fail in this target attack because their real camera capture projections are classified as paintbrush rather than mushroom, where our spot successfully fooled the classifier. We also show untargeted attacks. The goal is to use adversarial projections to cause the classifier to misclassify the camera capture scene as any label other than Notion. 
The task is easier than targeted attacks. As shown in the fourth column, all three methods successfully fooled the classifier, but our spot looks stealthier. In summary, in this paper, for the first time, we formulated the stealthy projector-based adversarial attack as an end-to-end -end differentiable process and proposed a method named the SPA, which has higher attack success rates and meanwhile being stealthier. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bingyao. Uh, then let's go to the third presentation. Uh, the third speaker would be Qi Feng from Waseda University. Uh, his topic will be the 360 depth estimation in the wild. The depth 360 data sets as well as the network. Thank you for introduction. Uh, hi everyone, this is Chi Fan from Waseda University. It is my honor today to present you with our paper, 360 degree depth estimation in the wild, the depth 360 data set and the SecFields network. By providing a comprehensive view of the environment, omnidirectional images are very useful in a different field. For example, autonomous driving and virtual reality. In this work, we propose a method to estimate high quality depth map from a single omnidirectional image across different domains. With the ability to estimate the distance between objects and the point of view, we can then better accomplish tasks that require a good understanding of the scene, such as 3D understanding. I will showcase some usage at the very end of this presentation. Previously, it was very difficult to estimate 360 degree depths for outdoor images. On the one hand, there was no existing omnidirectional data set that includes dense depth maps for outdoor things. This is due to physical restrictions of imaging devices. On the other hand, existing methods designed for only indoor things show bad performance when we input outdoor data sets. Therefore, in this work, we try to solve both limitations and achieve depth estimation in the wild by using a lot of online 360 degree videos. We first propose a test time training method for generating a large scale data set. We then present a multitask network to take advantage of the data set by mimicking the human eye. I will first talk about the data set. Although infrared based sensors are efficient to capture depths like using a Kinect, they are ineffective to capture outdoor things. The main reason for that is that they are prone to sunlight interference and uh, usually they have a rather short effective range. Alternatively, synthetic samples suffer from domain gaps when applied to real world situations. Very recently, there are LiDAR based data sets being released. However, these data sets are mainly gathered for autonomous driving with very limited scenarios. In addition, due to being mounted to the top of the vehicles, the sensors also suffer from self occlusions. Therefore, in this work, we first tackle the problem of limited data sets by exploring the abundant source of data, 360 degree videos from the internet. We first pre-process successive frames from the video sequence to establish quality frame groups that can facilitate computing constraints of the sequence. We then propose novel temporal and geometry consistencies that are unique to this 360 degree video with horizontal spherical disparity model. We use test time training to iteratively fine tune a pre-trained model to satisfy the established constraints before we finally generate the depth map. Here are some videos we used in this work. And here are the corresponding depth maps we generated using the pro pro proposed test time training method. These are some samples in our large scale omnidirectional data set we call the Depth 360. It includes 30,000 high quality samples with a wide range of conditions. And the data set is available from the link in the paper. To take advantage of the data set and account for challenging scenarios with different depth scales, we propose an end to end two branch multitask network we call SecFuse. The upper peripheral branch regresses depth maps with equirectangular projection resembling human's peripheral vision to perceive depth. It is capable of capturing global context with a larger FOV. However, it will introduce distortion. 
The lower foveal branch estimates semantic segmentation with cube map, mimicking the foveal vision to distinguish between different local objects. This branch provides sharper boundaries for local objects, but introduces inconsistency between faces. Therefore, by fusing two branches with each other, our network combines advantage of more consistent global context and also sharper local details. Depth estimation and semantic segmentation are jointly learned to reveal the scene layout and the object shapes. While the peripheral branch enforces more consistent estimation, the foveal branch here is more robust to scale changes which frequently appear in outdoor scenes. And hence, this method can successfully take advantage of the proposed a more general data set. For more details regarding the loss function and how we train the network, please check out our paper. Here are some results of the proposed single view estimation. I would like to point out that our method is proposed to estimate depth from single views, considering it is more convenient and practical to gather images in real world applications. Therefore, some flickering caused by inconsistency between frames will happen. When we compare our result as a, uh, shown as a top right corner to the previous method, which is shown on the bottom, we can see that our methods show less artifact and the sharper details at local regions. By benchmarking against the state of the arts in both real and the synthetic domain, our accuracy, which is highlighted in yellow, outperforms, uh, outperforms previous methods. To showcase the application of our single view depth estimation method, we have implemented some demos with Unity 3D. Uh, here is an uh, example. By inputting a synthetic image, we first estimate the depth of the view. We then render different visual effects with correct occlusion. For example, the flooding effect. Here is an example of using a real world image as input. As you can see here, our method did a relatively good job separating the foreground and some basic geometry of the background aka the environment. Here is another example. And finally, we have some demos when testing our application on entirely randomly collected 360 degree images from the internet. In summary, in this work, we propose to utilize 360 degree videos in the wild to generate a large scale data set. We then propose an end to end multitask net architecture called SecViews that estimates depth from a single 360 degree image. By fusing the global context and local details, our design ensures a sharp and consistent depth prediction. We showcase improved performance with evaluation and to encourage future research. The data set and also the source codes will be released to the community. That is all. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Chifeng. Uh, if you have any questions, just put it on the uh, Discord channel. And uh, let's welcome the fourth speaker, Daniel Martin from the University of Zaragoza. Uh, his work is about Scan GAN 360, a generative model of realistic scan path for 360 degree images. Okay, Daniel, it's your time. Okay, so. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. So basically, virtual reality is an emerging medium that unlocks unprecedented experiences and has the potential to change the way we people consume content. However, in order to convey realistic experiences, it is crucial to understand how people behave in virtual reality. So this is a very challenging task and has been posed as a key problem in VR for very long. So in virtual environments, there is content in the whole 360 degrees around the user. Um, besides an like traditional media where content creator decides what to show, it is now the user who has full control of the camera. This translates into each user having a completely different behavior when viewing the same stimuli. So some works have tried to model visual attention in terms of saliency, 
where each region of the scene is assigned a value indicating how likely are users to draw their attention to them. However, saliency lacks temporal information. So in this footage from Sitzman et al, we can see how every user, which is depicted in a different color, explores the exact same scene. So in this case, each circle represents the exact point the user is looking at and the region around it is their field of view. So as we can see, each user is following a completely different trajectory. Each of these trajectory is what is called as campus. So basically our goal is for a given 360 scene to be able to generate a scan paths that mimic the behavior of real users while maintaining their variability. This can be of great relevance since capturing visual uh, variety and not viewing data from people can be a very cumbersome task. So it requires complex software and hardware setups to show content and capture viewing data for large amounts of participants whose viewing behavior has to be recorded for very long periods. And this task at the end requires hours and hours and just yields a limited amount of data. So this could also have a huge impact in many other applications such as narrative experiences, interior or museum design, virtual avatar or MPC design, or even for um, rendering techniques and algorithms. So given all of this, in this work, we propose a ScanGAN 360, which is a new generative adversarial approach to SCANPA generation for 360 images. So we basically adopt a generative adversarial approach. So our model is able to generate the SCANPA in a non-deterministic manner. So we basically follow traditional gun training schemas and fed our network with large amounts of real scan paths. We resorted to a novel parameterization of scan paths where each point is transformed into its three-dimensional representation in spherical space to avoid uh, ambiguities and discontinuities. And additionally, to ensure that our model is able to learn the whole distribution of realistic scan paths, we optimize our model through a dynamic time warping logs function. With all of this, our network learns how to sample different yet plausible scan paths for any unseen 360 scene. So please refer to the main document for further information on our model and training details. So uh, let me first show you some results. So what you are going to see here at the top left is a, a 360 scene. Bottom left shows um, a sample run through the scan path, but remember that there are many more as much as users uh, have seen the scene. And here in the right side, you are going to see three different predicted uh, scan paths that resemble the grand truth ones. So you are seeing this in a, a double speed for visualization purposes, and you can see that color uh, encodes time. And let me show you another some example. So basically, with the same arrangement as before, you can see how our predicted scan paths are somehow similar to the ground truth ones and tend to focus on the relevant parts of the scene, for instance, here in the black cheese pieces. So you can find a, a lot of additional uh, results in, in our supplementary material. Um, although some previous works have already attempted a scan path generation previously, they all present some limitations. So we have compared to them in a set of scenes from different data sets, and shown how our method is able to generate the scan paths that are closer to the human ones. So our, we are the first column here, the, the second column, PathGAN, is not able to focus on the most relevant parts of the scene. In the third column, Saltinet, trajectories are erratic and do not resemble the, the run truth ones. And the last column, uh, through it all models, is biased towards contrast changes. So we have also evaluated the ability of our scan paths to mimic the behavior of, of the human ones. Um, we have analyzed the temporal and spatial coherence of our scan path resulting to kernel density estimation. So for any given scene, we have obtained a scan path from the points of highest probability of kernel density estimation at each time instant. Um, this KD uh, at the end yields a probabilistic map uh, indicating what regions are more likely to be visited at each time step. So we are showing here a viewport centered on, in the point of, of highest probability of KDE. And this way we can see, let's say, the most probable scan path for a given scene and how it follows a plausible trajectory while focusing on the regions of interest in the scene. So again, please uh, 
freely refer to the main document for further details. So we have uh, also carried out additional behavioral evaluations, analyzing, for instance, the exploration time and speed of our generated scan paths or their congruency, among others. And we have compared them to, the, to those of the real ones. So just to conclude, we have presented a generative non-deterministic approach to scan path generation for 360 images based on a novel scan path parameterization a trained with a dynamic time warping loss function, which is able to generate virtual observers that behave as humans at a very, very low cost. So you can find all our code and model publicly available in our project page. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, let's welcome the fifth speaker, Amata Robos. Uh, she's from LMU Munich and her presentation will be about their work of a virtual reality based system for the screening and the classification of autism. Okay, Mata, go ahead. Thank you very much. So can you see properly my screen? Yes, right? Yes. Okay, then thank you very much. Um, hi everyone, my name is Marta Robles and I will be presenting a joint and interdisciplinary study between the FAO, TUM and LMO universities of Germany is under the name a virtual reality based system for the screening and classification of autism. So autism is a condition uh, characterized by differences in the communication and social interaction, but also by the presence of repetitive behavior. So especially autistic individuals might show these differences in the nonverbal domain. This is for example, during an interaction, a conversation, they might not establish eye contact. As a consequence of these differences, many autistic individuals may struggle in everyday life, which sometimes leads to depression or anxiety amongst others. Um, because of this, the early diagnosis can be beneficial for the person, but currently this process is not always reliable because um, it uses subjective measures and it's also very time consuming. So this might cause that many people with autism remain unrecognized without a diagnosis until adulthood. So in this project, our, role, our goal is to develop a tool for automatic screening of autistic non-verbal behavior to provide with uh, potential assistance and to reduce these long waiting times in the process of the diagnosis. So in a previous study, Janeva and colleagues instructed participants to do two tasks where they had to do some work, web research, sorry, while the eye gaze was tracked. They used machine learning and their approach had an accuracy of uh, 74%. In another study, this case, defining visions of interest and analyzing video recordings of diet participants having a conversation Geotesco and colleagues could get a classification accuracy up to 75,9%. Finally, Rotten colleagues suggest a social interaction between two participants having a conversation, and again, the uh, gaze data was recorded. The heat map shows how uh, people with autism were looking more at the background rather than in the eyes, areas of interest. And in this case, they achieved an accuracy of 92.9%. So while previous approaches already showed that uh, this technique is feasible, um, we wanted to create a screening tool that follows a single user assessment with an automatic procedure. So to do so, we designed virtual reality setting that consisted of an interaction between a participant and a fully virtual agent. We also decided to implement this in a supermarket, in a virtual supermarket, um, as for many people with autism, shopping is a challenging uh, daily living skill. So we used a male and female virtual avatars to represent the participants in the simulation accordingly. And similarly, we used a virtual character as a representation for the embodied agents. Please uh, check uh, the paper if you need more details. So after a tutorial that aimed at getting familiar with the controllers, but also ensuring a perceptual a perception of sense of embodiment for the user, the participants were asked to buy a number of products shown on a shopping list uh, as the main task. You can see it now. 
Yeah, so they did so uh, by pointing at the product and pushing the trigger button. After selecting an item, the agent would bring the product and would narrate a little story about that product. If the participant selects an item that is not in the list, the agent asks to try again. Once the final product of the list is delivered, then the agent requests payment and the simulation ends. So for data acquisition and login, we firstly define areas of interest in the eyes, mouth, heads of the virtual agent and also background of the environment. Then we uh, collected the participants on verbal behavior. This was not only the A case through A tracking, but also the body movement data that included the position and the rotation of the head and hands. Our system is designed to collect and log data during the social setting in the shopping scenario. And this is more completely in each of the monologues where the agent, the shopper seller is talking about a product. So in total, we collected a data of uh, 28 participants. And for analysis, we chose an equal amount of data from these two groups, the autistic individuals groups and the typically developed individuals groups. We did two data sets. One data set was to be analyzed, selecting the best matching participants and from both groups. And then the other data set was uh, decided at random. So this allows for cross-checking evaluation results. As you can see in the presented table, the participants were matched by gender, age, and intellectual quotient, both for the match uh, set and the random set. If you need more information, please again check the article. So now we will present our main results. The graph uh, denote the means and standard errors of each group. So this is the autistic individuals, typically developed individuals from both match and uh, random groups. So after comparison with the students to test, we found as expected significant differences between the two groups in the regions of interest of the eyes and background, meaning that the autistic individuals looked less in the eyes and more in the background when compared to these typically developed individuals. But contrary to our expectations, we did not find such a difference when having a look at the area of interest of the mouth as previous studies showed. We also compared the means and standard errors of both groups with regards of uh, gaze shift along axis and head movements around axis, but very small significant uh, differences were found in this case. Yeah. So in order to apply classification using an LSTM network, various steps needed to take place. After collecting the data, this data was scaled and reprocessed by taking the averages of each of these monologues where the shopper is talking about an item. We perform an 80-20 training and test the split, and we evaluated three main methods, a logistic regression, a super vector machine, and an LSTM uh, where parameters and use features were defined by analysis, and then the results were explored. Uh, for a matter of time, we cannot go in detail, but again, if you need more information, please refer to the article. So here you can see some of the classification results of our machine learning strategies. Firstly, an evaluation of simple approaches confirmed that the multi-layer perception uh, with two layers uh, already used in a relatively high accuracy of 98% uh, in our data set. Furthermore, a multi-layer uh, res that respected the time of the tenses for the nonverbal responses in the time even outperformed uh, these simple approaches and could result into a 100% accuracy, as you can see, an 82.9 sensitivity and 98.7 specificity in the state just said. While this evaluation involved all features, we also wanted to know which features were uh, or could be considered the most important. And we found that the focus on the background area, eyes area, head area, and mouth were the four major contributors. Um, for the details, again, please check the paper. And as a summary in discussion, our uh, virtual reality-based system could help in objectively support the diagnosis of autism. Our procedure is not invasive and we calculate that this could be done in 45 minutes more or less. Our results again are in line with previous findings. 
But of course, our results cannot be um, blindly generalized and have some limitations, such as, of course, the sample size that poses the risk of introducing overfitting in the neural network. Um, future research should include a wider age range because in here we only tested adults, but also um, different cognitive styles, because in our case, we only had adults without intellectual disability. We also recognize that our agent is not yet capable of initiating and maintaining bidirectional communi social communication. So of course, the um, interaction of our agent is a little bit limited. So in future works, we aim to increase the sample size to include other conditions, not only autism, we also aim to adjust our virtual environment into different populations, such as you can see here in the picture, this is a prototype for kids. And we would like to make our uh, agent more smoothly, maybe using the Wizard of Oz paradigm or even making it more intelligent. Of course, finally, future research should also aim to clinically validate the presented results. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Mata. Uh, let's uh, go to the final presentation. Uh, let's welcome Yuta from Osaka University. And the topic is online project deep learning using a convolutional neural network. Okay, Yuta, please start. Okay, uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, I'm Yuta Kagema from Osaka University in Japan. Uh, I will pre uh, present an online project at the technique using a convolution neural network. In projection mapping, uh, computer generated images are overlaid onto non planar and dynamic objects. Uh, in this case, uh, the shallow depth of field of the projector is a uh, problem. Uh, this is because the projected image will be degraded by the network spread. Conventional debugging methods project a special pattern such as a dot pattern uh, for estimating the debugger kernel or the point spread function PSF. Then the inverse of the PSF is converted with the target image to obtain the edge enhanced compensation image. The compensation image elevates the default spread in the projected result. However, the conventional debugging methods require the frequent projection of a dot pattern when the screen is moved, which is not preferable in user experience. From here, I explain the motivation of our research for projector debugging. First, we don't project calibration patterns like a dot pattern. Second, we don't use additional devices or multiple projectors. Finally, we use the power of deep neural network. Uh, I will explain the proposed method. We propose to apply convolutional neural network to estimate the PSF and generate the compensation image. Our defocus net estimates the spatially varying PSFs called the focus plan map from the projected result of the previous frame rather than that of a dot pattern. The default Casper map uh, represents how much each pixel of the projected image has been blurred. In addition, our luminous net estimates a luminous attenuation map that represents the degree of reduction of the captured luminous of the projected result uh, compared to that of uh, target luminous due to the inverse scale of light intensity. Uh, please note that other information is also injected to this network, so I uh, refer to the paper for the details. Then the compensation net generates a compensation image from these maps and the target image of the current frame. Uh, by projecting a compensation image, the focus bra is suppressed. Throughout this process, dot pattern images are not required to be projected. We synthesize a dataset for training the network. First, we place a projector, a camera, and a projection surface in a virtual space, where the projector and the camera share the same optical axis. 
Then we, we compute the depth in each of the surface. From the depth map and the focal plane of the project, we compute the defocus plane map, which is used to generate a blurred image. Then this project, uh, this, uh, this projected image is captured by the camera. The luminance is attenuated due to the inverse square law of light intensity. Therefore, we generate a luminance attenuation map representing the luminance reduction. Uh, based on the luminous attenuation map, the intensity of the blood image is attenuated. Finally, we slightly wrap the generated image considering the imperfection of the alignment of the projector and the camera in a physical setup. I will explain how to learn the defocus net and luminous net. After the projecting the projection image, each network estimates the uh, map uh, from these images. We then calculate the loss between the estimated map and the true map used for pseudo projection. The compensation net uh, generates a compensation image from the target image and the two maps. We then calculate the loss between the compensated pseudo projected result and uh, the target image whose luminous is normalized according to the pseudo projection. We show the projection result when the movement of the projection surface is translated. And this is uh, our projection result. Next, we show the projection result when the movement of the projection surface is rotated. This is a projection result. Next, I will show the usefulness of the warping process for pseudo projection. This experiment compares the defocus blind map output from the defocus net trained using the data set without and with the warping process. In this example, uh, where an image is projected onto a rotating surface, the left side of the projected result gets blurred according to the rotation. Uh, as shown in the right result, the estimated defocus plan map is less affected by the projected image contents when the dataset is generated by incorporating the warping process. One of the limitations of our project is the lack of real-time performance. The image size used in this experiment was uh, 256 pixels in height and width, and the generation time per image was 71.70 uh, milliseconds. However, we think that in the future, high-resolution images will need to be processed in real-time, and this will be our next goal. We believe that we can get closer to our this next goal by referring to the uh, network structure designed for real-time developing of high-resolution images in computer vision, as shown in right uh, bottom. And this is the conclusion. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Yuta. So now we finished all the presentations. Now let's go to the question and answer part. So. We've already got several questions from audiences, uh, but because of our, we have quite limited time, probably only you know, one or two questions for each uh, presenter. So uh, I will start with the first paper. So Qi Jing, uh, I, yeah. I, I have a question for your uh, paper. So um, I, want, I wonder in your deep model, or why it needs to be done separately for different transformation components? Uh, why you are, why are you, you, I mean, not training the neural networks for predicting the whole transformation metrics? Why will you need to split them into translation, uh, rotation, uh, and scaling? Uh, do you have any uh, special concern or uh, considerations about that? Or it is just, uh, you know, how it is designed and uh, for convenience or whatever reason? Okay, thank you. 
for question. Uh, we also consider uh, to estimate is, is, is is the uh, uh, homography to trans transform the image, but it's, it's hard. So we just divide, divide into the three compo components, including the rot rotation, translation, and the perspective. So I, we think that make it easy to solve the problem. Okay. Okay, then uh, for the uh, SPAA paper, um, uh, Bing Yao, uh, could you answer Daisuke's question? Uh, he wonder how robust is your method to illumination change or camera movement or other disturbances? Uh, I think he means things like, you know, uh, sickness or something like, uh, you know, motion blur, things like that. Yeah, um, thank you, Prof. Zhang. Yeah, actually, um, our SPAR in this work, actually, we only consider the static setup. Um, and I think the um, the camera movement, distances, and even the light conditions uh, may affect our uh, the attack success rate. Uh, actually, I think uh, in the future, if we consider those uh, factors, our method can be more robust and more interesting. Um, and actually, uh, I just found an interesting work uh, published in ICCV 2020 workshop, uh, 2021 workshop. Uh, I posted that uh, in the Discord channel, I, and the interesting uh, readers can refer to that paper for more uh, inspirations. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bingyao. Um, yeah, and for the uh, 360 depth estimation work, uh, Qi Feng, uh, could you, uh, the, the audiences are quite interested in the demo you show for the 360 video depth estimation. So they wonder, uh, is it generated in real time for the depth map? And uh, is, is, your, is your work supporting directly input a whole video to generate the um, depth map quite fast? Yeah, okay, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, uh, for estimating every single frame, it usually costs around like 100 milliseconds. So I think it's quite fine to run in real time. Uh, however, because we are doing single view estimation, so we do not consider the temporal consistency between frames. So that means if we input the video, it can output, I mean, a series of uh, death maps, but they are not, sometimes it will cause flickering like I showed in the uh, demo. So in the future, we might look into that to how to solve the real time consistency problem. But in the current implementation, we do not. Okay, okay, thank you. And I have a question. Uh, so uh, I, I note that because, you know, the distortion in the equirectangular representation is quite, uh, you know, different with the rectilinear images. So how are the errors in your uh, results distributed in terms of the spatial position? I mean, do the, do the distortions in the top and the bottom region in the equirectangular representation matter a lot uh, in your estimation? Oh, yeah. Regarding that, we try to use a similar fashion with omni depths, which is uh, one of the first work to do this kind of 360 degree depth estimation. They use the changing uh, convolution size to, to account for that, because I mean, the information distribution is different across the equirectangular image, right? So for the more sparse region, they take a larger uh, convolutional kernel to make sure that it will be more, uh, how can I say, to unify, uh, uniform to calculate the loss to prevent some region weight more than others. Okay, 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 thank you. Um, all right, uh, here is a question for Daniel about the scan GAN 360. Um, yeah, so the uh, initial point of a scan path seems quite important, right? So right. when you train your neural network or when you test it, uh, how do you uh, process about the initial point of the path? You are just, uh, uh, I, I know if you have trained it, uh, the, you can generate an initial path and then you, you just follow that point and to generate the further path. But when you train it, when you generate your uh, ground truth, have you ever uh, taken any consideration on that part mm -hmm. to select the initial point? 
Yeah, so, so thank you so much for the question. That's a very, very interesting question. So the data set we are training on is the Seeds Manito data set and their, their viewing data was captured from four different starting points from 90 degrees of, of longitudinal distance. And in, our, in one of our first implementations, we found that our network was learning that bias and was learning uh, how to uh, generate this campus only from four different positions. So we include a, a data augmentation technique uh, that is explained in the main paper, which is basically uh, changing, it's like uh, like rectangular panoramas are longitudinal, con longitudinally continuous. You can like uh, you can like take the leftmost and the rightmost part of the panorama and put them together. We basically displaced like the panorama. We did some data random data augmentation so that each scampa that our uh, network was seeing was starting from a different uh, latitudinal longitudinal starting point. And then our network uh, learned that uh, he could start as campus for any from any single position. And actually, uh, we we also during the, the design uh, process, we also checked that our network actually learned how to start as randomly start as campus for any longitudinal position, and it actually actually did. So we basically did this, this data augmentation, this data uh, warping uh, stuff, longitudinal warping stuff. Uh, and, and the network actually learned it. Okay, thank you, Daniel. It makes uh, perfect sense. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, here is a question for uh, Mata about the virtual reality system for screening and classification. Uh, Riku wonders uh, whether you have considered to use audio input or other components for the classification. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. So actually it's a great idea and we thought about including this, but our system currently does not require that the participant talks or produces any verbal communication as we are only focusing in this part of the verbal communication. But indeed, it's very interesting because in autism, we know that they might have um, different aspects in the tone of voice, for example. So we're going to have this into account definitely. And maybe if we can achieve a more sophisticated agent or using the uh, Wizard of Oz, but I think maybe we could uh, yeah, do that. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also have a following question uh, regarding mm -hmm. uh, how to do the classification training. Uh, I wonder uh, how long the sequence need to be, I mean, the recorded sequence uh, as your, as your uh, data or your samples. How long need them to be uh, to train a reasonable model? Does they need to be very long or it could be arbitrary length and uh, your LSTM is able to distinguish things quite well? So maybe I help in from a technical perspective as this was an interdisciplinary paper. And thank, thank you for the question. Um, so thank you, the, Daniel. The, the, <laughs> no problem. So the monologues were about, I think, uh, just under a minute uh, to one minute 20 or so long. So they don't need to uh, be extremely long. We didn't test whether we can go uh, quicker in this mo monologue. So it may be that we look into the future if we can even have shorter monologues from the agent telling the story. Um, that would be, of course, interesting because we yeah, have a, a bit uh, about a minute is, is relatively long. Uh, but there were uh, some stories that we nicely picked, so they're also uh, kind of interesting to hear, I guess. And uh, yeah, we did not experiment with much longer or uh, shorter phases, so that may be a good point, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your classification, clarification. So, okay, uh, we have uh, yeah two minutes left. So uh, let's move to Utah's paper. So Utah, uh, I have a question about your neural networks. Um, I, I, I note that you have three different components um, that the focus net, the uh, composition net, and a illumination net. Uh, I wonder which part contributes the most to the final you know, results uh, or they are equivalent in importance. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. In my opinion, uh, all components are important, but uh, especially uh, the focus uh, the focus net is uh, most uh, it's the most important because uh, uh, generate the focus bra map is important to compensate uh, the focus bra. Uh, okay. 
the second important uh, component is a uh, compensation net because it's uh, it's generates directly a uh, compensation image uh, which is uh, a core of our project thank you all right okay thank you so uh, i also have another question for you so um yeah, we know that sometimes when you project things to a screen, that screen could be not, you know, a perfect plan planner surface. So does your does your work, you know, fit well if there is manner, I mean, distortion or or manner a noisy uh, surface <laughs> parts? <laughs> uh, it, it's a good question. Thank you. And actually, I performed the. the our experiment in planar surface and uh, curved, simply curved surface, uh, which uh, whose result is not written our uh, not written in our paper. But uh, actually, I didn't uh, perform the uh, projection experiment with uh, complex surface. So uh, this is our uh, <laughs> next plan. Okay. Thank cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, so is there any other question for the presenters? Uh, if no other questions from the audience, uh, let's thank all the uh, six excellent presenters and well done everyone. Uh, let's call an end of this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.